This is the season to be excited. It, I'm just hearing it. There's an excitement beginning or continuing to roll through the kingdom. I'm listening for the trumpet, of course. My eyes are stayed upon God. We're going to talk about that today. But I am hearing from rabbis and messianic Jews, and I'm hearing from fellow pastors and teachers in the kingdom. And everybody is rumbling about the same thing that, and I've said it for a long time, but I mean it evermore, that Jesus is coming. There is a hope for us that Jesus is coming, and we are in the season. We may not know the exact day or the exact hour, but I'm telling you, we are in that season. I believe we're in the last days, the last hours, the last minute, perhaps even the last seconds of the last minute. We still have work to do, church. There are people who need the gospel, and we need to get out and do that. We also need to take care of ourselves during this time, that we are a strong church for these last days. And I know that's so hard to do. We are so accustomed, those of us who uh, have the heart of God, that, that, that mind of Christ in us, is to reach out and take care of others. It's just the way that, that God wires us. Uh, there, there are altruistic people in this world, philanthropic organizations. There are kind-hearted people that are outside of the church. But everyone inside the church has been given a heart that's not of stone. It's been given a, a heart of God. And with that heart, we reach out and we love people. We want to take care of people. But it's getting harder <laughs> to take care of others and ourselves because there are so many needs. So many calls that come in, so many people needing prayer, uh, hard situations, deaths, sicknesses, diseases, divorces, um, relational troubles, political issues, uh, it, it, divisive things, riots. Uh, I mean, they go bigger and bigger and bigger to pandemics, right? And it's hard. I have a message today that in the midst of all of this is a very timely word from the Lord. Uh, it's uh, so timely. And I've called it staycation. Staycation. Now, I looked up the formal definition of a staycation, and it said this. A staycation is which an individual or a family stays home and participates in activities within driving distance of their home and does not need to travel or make overnight accommodations. Hmm. That's the official definition of staycation. But I applied this, or the Lord applied this, to my mind. A staycation in my mind. Because my mind shoots 20 different directions the minute my feet hit the floor. If you're, if you're a, a normal person with a normal life, you do the same thing. When your feet hit the floor, you begin to go in 20 different directions. If you have children, it's children and breakfast and office and home and work and cleaning and taking care of the house and going here and taking care of this person and thinking about that one and praying and reading your Bible, your mind just goes. And then for the rest of the day, it just goes, kush, 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 kush. it's just everywhere. And I wondered what would happen if my mind could take a staycation, <laughs> if I could just keep my mind focused on one thing. And in the midst of teaching a Bible study on this very thing, this is the, one of the pictures that God put in my head was a staycation. So if I told you that I could promise you that you could have perfect peace, absolute peace, continual, constant, consistent peace, what would you think? Would you look at me and say, Jenny, that is not possible. There is no way I can have that kind of established peace in my mind. Well, I can't promise you that. But I know the one who can, and his name is Jesus. And we're going to talk about how if we keep our mind on him, there is one phenomenal, astonishing promise 
that he gives us. Now, this is not a Bible study or a teaching about controlling your mind or taking your thoughts captive or the, the battlefield of the mind in regard to sin. This is, this is not that. This is basing our, our peace on his promise. And here's the promise. Now, I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation and then share some other translations so we can just let it absorb into our spirits. It is Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, verse 3, and it says this. You, God, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Fixed on you. The English Standard Version says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The New American Standard reads, the steadfast mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts you. I love the message. The message really really sets it up for me. People with their minds set on you, God, you will keep completely whole, steady on their feet because they keep at it and don't quit. Keep it what? They keep their mind on him. They don't quit what? They don't quit focusing their thoughts on God. Let me read that again in the message. People with their minds set on you, you, God, you keep them completely whole, steady on their feet because they keep at it and don't quit. This is God's promise to us that in the shifting sand of this world, we can be steady on our feet. That in the midst of the chaos of this world, we can have a steadfast mind and a peace. We can have a peace in the midst of the chaos. We can, we can, we don't have to be shifting with times and circumstances. We can be steadfastly focused on God. And he promises, promises to keep us at peace. I don't know about you, church, but there is no time like this time that we need to find a peace for us. The mind is where unrest starts. It, it, the mind is where it all begins. The mind is the place that the enemy comes in his attempt to take away your peace. Let me go back to the very first couple on this earth. It, and it said that they walked with God in the cool of the day. They were in intimate fellowship with God. They were focused on him. They were looking to him. They were listening to him. They were interacting with him. They were intimately in relationship with their creator, with God himself. And God would come down in the cool of the day and fellowship. Their intentions were totally on God. And Satan went, psst, hey, psst, Eve, look this way. And Eve didn't just take her eyes and put them on the wrong tree. She took them off of God. See, Satan has done that from the beginning. It's not that he wants you to look at something. It's that he doesn't want you to look at God. Because if for a moment he can get your attentions and your focus away from God, he's got you looking and focusing on something else in your life. This has been Satan's ploy from the very beginning. It's a simple shift of focus and where your mind is stayed. Had Eve stayed her mind upon God, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. Amen? This is Satan and his ploy. And he wants to come and he wants to destroy the peace of mind that you have inside. He wants to, for you to, to feel unsettled and chaotic all the time. Now, this is a very special thing. In English, we have superlatives or... 
um, interjections uh, that set apart sentences like hooray or wow, awesome, oh, rats. I mean, we have all these words that convey an emotion. Like we, and we would repeat things like, oh, it was really, really, really good, or that was so, so, so hard, or that was, oh, 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 it was great. It was just great, great, great. And we repeat things for emphasis. Well, in Hebrew, there aren't a lot of superlative words. It's a very basic verb, noun kind of language. There aren't a lot of, of big descriptive terms in Hebrew. There are. There's some beautiful ones. So because they don't have as many of those superlative or um, interjection kind of words, they use repetition as in a way of intensifying a word. And so when Jesus says verily, verily, or truly, truly, he's saying really, 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 you can trust this saying. Uh, it's just such an emphasis. So when the angels in like Isaiah chapter six say, holy, holy, holy is God, those three holies in a row are, is an understanding that, that is so beyond us about the holiness of God. We, can, we, we can't even understand one holy, but to understand the trifecta of three holies in a row is beyond what we can comprehend. He is so holy that it takes three words. Well, this word peace in the Hebrew in Isaiah 26 is such a word. Perfect peace are the, is the word shalom, shalom. Perfect peace, shalom, shalom. In other words, Isaiah is not saying he will keep you in shalom, whose mind is stayed upon him. He will keep you in shalom, shalom, in a peaceful peace. That's huge in Hebrew. Shalom, shalom. It's a perfect peace, not just a peace. It's absolutely perfect. And this is the promise of God. Now, God has been revealing scriptures to me for years in word pictures. That's why we're called Brushstroke Ministries. Because people say that when I, when I, when I would teach... I would paint a picture of the Word of God, and then I would do it one brushstroke at a time. And he's always given me pictures, but the last few months, it, it, it's almost like the Bible has become a picture book for me, a children's book, where I open it up and I'm reading, and a picture comes to me. I mean, God just opens up uh, my mind to see a picture of what he's saying. And he gave me a picture of a set of double doors, not double in width, but double as in two of them. Like when you would go into a department store and you would open up the outside doors coming in from the parking lot, let's say it's raining outside, and you come into the parking lot, coming from the parking lot, and you open the double doors and then you go in and there's like a, a, a little hall, like a little place there and then there's another set of double doors that takes you into the store and what you do is you get in the first set of double doors and you put your umbrella down you shake it off you shake yourself off you put things away you get your purse ready and then you go through the next set of double doors into the department store and this is the picture God gave me about perfect peace that when you come through that first door you have peace you're not in the rain anymore but somewhere between the first door and second door you still are thinking about the rain you're still thinking about the car whether you're locked it or not? Did you leave your purse there? I mean, everything happens in this little, this little, you know, eight by 12 kind of room between the two sets of doors. But the minute you walk into the next set of doors, your mind just goes to the department store and it goes to what department's here and why well, can smell the perfume department there and old women's clothing is over here and every, and you're, you're all of a sudden you've forgotten what's behind you, not just from the first set, but the second set that you're, it's so far away from you. Your mind has focused now on everything wonderful in front of you. This is the picture for perfect peace. And we can, some people come through that first door and they have peace, but they're looking out that door, looking at the rain, still thinking about what's coming. 
for what they came from. And they stood in a little place in between, kind of in, just kind of hanging and dangling betwixt two parts. But those of us who know God have the access to the second door and can go through and leave everything behind. This is the picture of perfect peace. This is the place and the source of it. It's God and God's presence alone. Now to be kept in perfect peace, our mind must be stayed upon God. Now this word in the Hebrew is the word samak, and it comes from the root word to prop up or to lean on. It has the idea of leaning on something, and again, the word picture that God gave me. You know, most of us, if not all of us, have had children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, other people's children, and you've been in the back seat of a car with them, and you're sitting next to them, and it's a little bit of a trip, and little by little, that little child just begins to lean over, and then they put their head down on you, and they fall asleep. This is the picture God said is perfect peace. You see, they are so sure about who they're leaning upon that they don't have a care. They don't think, gosh, is this person going to want me to lay my, lay, lay my head on them? Is this person going to hit me or shake me or wake me up? Listen, when that little child lays their head on you, you do everything you possibly can to keep them from waking up. You start reaching for things with your feet. You even get a crunk in your neck because you can't move and you refuse to move because you don't want to wake this little one up over here because they've leaned upon you and they're trying trusting you. You could go through a, 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 a rainstorm and this little one here is just sleeping so peacefully, not a care in the world. That's the picture of somak in the Hebrew, to lean upon in perfect peace. And God says this, I promise that if you just lean into me and put your head down, Close your eyes. Keep your mind focused on me. I will keep you in perfect peace. Wow. So what are you leaning your mind on? What are you establishing your mind on? What, what are you thinking about and propping your mind up? If you're like the rest of us, usually it's the world. We get up in the morning, we want to know how many new cases of COVID or who died and who has COVID. The news says this and, and news blasts us. You can't get away from news. God said, you have started your day, stayed upon the world, focused on the world. If we would just get up and begin with staying our minds, putting our minds on God and focusing on leaning on him, then the rest of this stuff, God said, will not shake you. You will not be quaking from this. You will have a stability and an establishing on good, rocky ground and not shifting sand. If our mind is stayed upon ourselves or on our problems or even on other people, we won't have perfect peace. Satan, let me say it again, Satan loves to get our minds on anything but the Lord. The battle for trust and where our minds lie begins right here. So let me show you a couple of the verses uh, to cement this in, to show you how inextricably peace and your mind are linked in Scripture. This is Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, we know these verses, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving in your heart, let your request be made known to God. That's the easy part. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The peace of God, not our peace, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will do what? Guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. You see, God says, if you would lean into me, 
If you would stay your thoughts and your mind and your focus on me, I will guard your heart and mind, and I will keep it in that perfect peace. The word guard, I love this, means to post a guard or to be a watcher in advance. In other words, he said, I will guard you so much. I'll guard your, if you give me your mind and give me your thoughts and stay them on me, I will keep you in perfect peace. How do you keep me there, God? Because I'm a watcher of things coming in advance. I'm seeing things that you'll never see, and I'm going to protect your peace. Protect your peace because I see it coming. This is beautiful and powerful. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, will watch in advance your, over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is an easy one, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and what? Life and peace. To be spiritually minded is peace. How about this one? John 14, 27. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give this to you. Let not your heart and your minds and your thoughts be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. That word trouble means to be stirred or agitated. And God said, this is not how I want my people to live. I never called my, my people to live in agitation and a constant stirring. I called my people to live in peace. I created them with the opportunity to have peace reigning within them, a peace of their mind. You will keep in perfect peace all whose mind or thoughts are stayed and fixed upon you. That's what it said in Isaiah 26, verse 3. But I want, to, I want to go on to the very next verse for a moment and do chapter 26 of Isaiah, but I want to do verse 3 and go on to verse 4 because there's a key here. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Then the, Isaiah said, trust the Lord forever. Why? For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. There are a lot of tiny stones in this world that we trip up on. And there's a lot of shifting sand in this world. What was right yesterday is wrong today. What was wrong yesterday is right today. You know, what we stand for yesterday is not what we stand for today. What lives matter today don't matter tomorrow, or they don't matter as much as they did a year ago. Uh, everything is changing. Laws change. Morals change. Ethics change. Truth changes. Not the truth, but the world's truth. It changes. There is only one solid rock that never, ever changes. And that's Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is shifting sand. All other ground is shifting sand. Now there's a powerful declaration back in the Old Testament. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Samuel 2, 2. No one is holy like the Lord. And there is no one besides you, nor there is there any rock like our God. You see, God is saying, I will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed upon me. Why? Because I am the rock, the everlasting, constant consistent, unchanging, unwavering, stable cornerstone rock on which you can live and have your peace found in that. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He is the rock that the builders rejected. He is the rock on which we stand. And if I stand on that firm foundation and lean in to my God and rest my thoughts and rest my mind 
and keep it totally focused on God. He promises me not just shalom, which is wholeness and wellness. He promises me shalom, shalom, really, really, really a lot of peace. Totally, totally peace. This is what God has. And he says, this is like a staycation. You know, we, when we go on vacation, we think of everything that we have to take and everything we have to do. We think of going here and doing this. And God said, when you have a staycation, your mind is just focused on what's right at home, just what's right in your house, just what's right around you. And God said, this is what I'm asking the church to do, just to take some staycation time with God, to put our minds on him, to focus on him, to keep our mind stayed upon him. So this world only offers chaos. It only offers instability and ever-changing. God's word declares that he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And there is no shadow or changing in him. Who he was is who he is and who he ever, ever will be. And he loves you. And he wants you to lean into him not into the things of this world, but to lean in to him. If you do not know him, oh, can we help you find your place to lean into this wonderful God? He died that you might have life in him, life of peace, not as the world gives, but as he gives. Call us at the office, get online, shoot us an email, whatever you need to do. We want to lead you to him because it's his life that he's painting with you one brush stroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brush Stroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.